Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. Just finished chatting with John Hawley from the Australian Catholic University, a wealth of knowledge on all things exercise, nutrition, type 2 diabetes, etc. We talked about how acute exercise in people with type 2 diabetes reduces the glucose actually during exercise and then also makes the muscle more sensitive to insulin for 24 to 48 hours. We also talked a lot about how we need to try and get away from being so structured with exercise. So, you know, try to snack so do exercise throughout the day um, do brisk walking not so you know rigid recommendations about exercise you know 150 minutes a week etc just try and accumulate the exercise talked also about nutrition so in particular time restricted feeding we discussed whether people with type 2 diabetes should perhaps wear a continuous glucose monitor to get feedback on their glucose levels with various foods and exercise for a couple of weeks we discussed findings in the lab compared to real world situations. We also talked about how most studies in people with type 2 diabetes are not your sort of garden variety person with diabetes, but people that are diet controlled and whether we can apply those results. We talked about how diet and exercise are very different because exercise, you're actually turning over your substrates and that might be very important. So for example, you're burning your fat, you're resynthesizing glycogen. Diet doesn't really turn over the substrates like exercise does. I really think you'll get a lot out of this one, so stick around. Hi, John. How are you? Good, Glenn. Good to see you. Actually, just back from um, South Korea last week at a diabetes meeting, so uh, no jet lag, but uh, a considerable drop in temperature from their summer, so uh, a nice, interesting meeting there. Well, there you go. Yeah, I saw that on Twitter. Yeah. So it was a nice meeting. They decided to have it live at the last minute, and a few of the speakers were... Uh, were coming in remotely but there was about six or seven hundred people there really really good interesting meeting um not much on exercise there was a lot on drugs a lot on uh you know some of the hepatic glucose inhibitors and the such like but it was a little bit disappointing to see how perhaps the primary intervention such as exercise and nutrition have probably been left behind in the rush to find a a drug target for type 2 uh, or insulin resistant patients so yes a little little disappointing but a great meeting and great hospitality well, it's the way it tends to be, isn't it? You know, my wife, Kathy, she used to work at the International Diabetes Institute. And I think it's got a bit better now, but they always said, you know, that there's the three pillars of treatment. So there's the, mm. the medicine, the diet and the exercise, but they had all these medical doctors and all these dietitians, but they didn't really. Kathy ended up being the the combined dietitian and exercise person. So. Yeah, well, what I, I don't think, uh, you know, it's not to belittle the drugs. The drugs have a place, but once you've got the blood glucose control you know, fairly well manageable, then you can add the exercise and nutrition. That seems to be the way the physicians think about it now, rather than looking at the primary preventions and then saying, well, perhaps we don't need as much insulin or as much insulin sensitizing drugs or whatever they happen to be. So you can attack it both ways. It's almost like a, a, a cumulative causation model. You've got to, you know, knock into that circle at some point, but I'd prefer to knock in with the exercise and nutrition to start with, but that's just me. Well, that's, that's exactly, that's my feeling. I, I know I went to some, it was like a meeting in Melbourne and there was, I can't remember who it was, but it was a medical uh, endocrinologist up there. And he was saying, look, I know ideally we'd like to say, you know, diet and exercise. And if things don't work, then we'll think about the medications. But he said, you know, on average, people just don't do it. So all yeah. we've done is wasted months and months. So he likes to put them on metformin straight away. And I was just like, oh, God. Well, that seems to be, that's the, it, it's an easy thing. And again, it's not an anti-physician uh, diatribe here at all. But the point is, it's much easier to write a prescription and get them out of your surgery than it is to spend hours telling them about exercise and nutrition, which all due respect to the medical fraternity, they get about six years in medical school. So um, it's very frustrating. And I think until we actually change the medical curriculum and put exercise a nutrition in a more prominent place that will continue to have this problem for for many many years the other thing which um don't get me started on is the old bariatric surgery of course you know and you get the same argument from the you know the the clinicians there that you've wasted three or six months trying to get them to do exercise and diet it doesn't work you know bring them in i can give them surgery and within overnight or within at least a week you know you've got blood glucose control managed fantastically so i hear it i hear it from both sides as you've obviously done as well well you're a new zealander originally right you're in maybe think about date remember david longy the new zealand <laughs> prime minister he had he yes. just stapled and then he busted them well that was a uh, that was a long while ago well actually let, let me just go back to your question am i a new zealander well yes i have a new zealand and a british passport born in new zealand parents emigrated 
did all my schooling in New Zealand, then went back to the UK to do my undergraduate degree at Loughborough. Then, as you know, because we both went to the yeah, same, yeah. Time, went to Ball oh, State yeah. University, studied with Dave Costell, yes. and then uh, the University of Cape Town Medical School for 10 years, including a postdoc with Tim Noak. So uh, I'm a little confused nationality wise, but yes, yeah. I always watch the All Blacks with a much more interest than I do the Wallabies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and South Africa, exactly. <laughs> well, no, I don't like the South Africans. They play too much of a kicking game, but uh, All Blacks, as, as you are, of course. Absolutely, All Blacks, All Blacks. Although they are having a bad run, but let's, let, we don't have a lot of American listeners and they probably don't know that much about rugby. Although, yeah, anyway. Well, the All Blacks, about... for, the, for the record, it, you can take any NBA team. The All Blacks still have the most winningest record of any sports team ever at 79%, although that is plummeting as we speak. But... Uh, Still greater than, you know, LA Lakers or any other team that you care to think about. So uh, apologies to the Americans well, in the audience. It's but... funny you say that, actually, because I, I always said that to everyone as well. They've got the winningest record of any international. But then the America's Cup. So it's a bit of a weird one. But, you know, they, they won that for 132 years in a row or something. Yeah, but I was just watching sport. that on Netflix. Sailing, that's sailing, not, a sailing, not a sport, Glenn. Sailing that's sailing. not a proper sport. <laughs> All right. So if you think about, let's try and redress this thing. Let's talk about exercise rather than, than drugs here. Yeah? So um, let's redress the balance. Exercise is medicine, as you know. Yep. So if we think about, you know, what's happening. So the person's got type 2 diabetes, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so if we can get later, we can talk about, okay, how do we try and prevent this? But if someone's got type 2 diabetes, let's just set the scene. So when they exercise... You know, a lot of people don't realize, but, you know, their glucose uptake is pretty normal, yeah? Did you want right. to just flesh that out? So during exercise, what's happening to their metabolism? Then we can think a bit more later on about, you know, what happens after exercise. And All right. Uh, look, that's a good place to start there, Glenn. I mean, as, as you know, most of the type 2 subjects have uh, not profound hyperglycemia, but they may come in with a blood glucose of around 7 or 8, 9 millimolar bearing in mind that the normal concentration for normal healthy individuals is you know four to five millimolar so we know that if you give them one acute bout of exercise in other words a single bout of moderate intensity exercise and this study was done actually many years ago by a guy called nick musi in laurie goodyear's lab he showed that just 45 minutes of moderate intensity exercise exercising at a heart rate of around 70 percent of your max was sufficient to reduce blood glucose concentrations to normal glycemic levels. So if you look at the two graphs, you would see that they type two diabetics started with a much higher glucose, but after all, only 15 minutes of exercise, their glucose was the same as non-diabetic subjects. The interesting thing about that study is that they all show, followed them up post-exercise and they saw that the muscle was still what we call insulin sensitive, which means that you've overridden some of the defects in the muscle and the muscle is capable of soaking up that glucose after exercise. So when they looked at the amount of carbohydrate or glucose being put back into the muscle as glycogen, they noticed the curves were exactly the same for the type two and the, and the untrained, or I should say the healthy individual. So the point of that is that acute exercise can literally, if you like, overnight cure glucose control very, very rapidly. Uh, and that's a good thing because we know that type two diabetics spend a lot of time in hyperglycemia. And we may get onto this later, but we've got a trend now with our patients in our clinic that we, rather than give them a long exercise bout, you know, as well as I do, the recommendations don't work. People don't do 150 minutes of exercise. They're not gonna do 30 or 40 minutes continuous exercise unless they're an athlete or unless they've got a background. We're into this sort of what we call exercise snacking. Mm -hmm. Now, what do we mean by that? We don't mean food snacking. We mean taking small bouts of exercise before and after meals, perhaps twice a day and accumulating exercise over the course of the day. And I think that's the way to go. I think to continually say to people, these are the recommendations from American College of Sports Medicine, American Heart Diabetes Association, no matter what it is that you've got to accumulate exercise let's start accumulating it over the day rather than over the whole week. So I think one message to get home, a take home message for the listeners would be, if you are a diabetic, maybe think about breaking your exercise bouts up and spacing them either before or after meals, perhaps at midday, perhaps another 10 minutes at night and accumulating that 20 or 30 minutes a day. Okay. So basically just being more active, right? So we've been trying to say this for a while, you know, get off the, get off the tram and stop early, you know, park, don't park so close. I guess the thing you start to think about there is, you know, the, the sort of intensity of the exercise. So a couple mm -hmm. of the podcasts I've had um, leading up to this, so I've had um, Ben Levine on talking about how walking 
is great metabolically, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, you know, ha have cardiac effects. It doesn't increase your left ventricle volume. Uh, it doesn't increase your VO2 max, et cetera. Yep. So I guess, are you saying just walking is, is good enough? Or you're saying they'd have to do something a little bit more intense? And I guess it depends on how fit they are, because for some people, if they're really unfit, and I guess we're talking about people with type 2 diabetes on average, I guess walking may be moderate intensity for them. Well, let's go back to come forward. So firstly, Ben Levine, here's a tidbit. Ben Levine's brother was one of the producers on Lord of the Rings. You didn't oh, know, that. Did not know that. that. No, well, I didn't until we went to dinner once with him in Newcastle and he pointed that out. Um, that's a sidebar, at least. So your questions there are very important. The study that we did, which was published by Monique Francis a few years ago in uh, Diabetologia, was exercise snacking, as I said, and it was only 10 to 15 minutes of brisk walking. And that was before uh, the main meals of the day. And the interesting thing is, as we started with, the acute effect is such that it lowers blood glucose. But the interesting thing is over the course of the day, it has a blood glucose lowering effect. And that's very important. And maybe something we'll make a note of and talk about later is this nocturnal glucose thing, which I'll, I'll get into. Perhaps we can delve into a little bit deeper later on. As far as the exercise intensity in those people, because remember that around 70% of type two diabetic people are a little bit overweight, sometimes uh, brisk walking is adequate. Yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe that, that, that is a good bridge to, to another study. We talk about the exercise and the type of exercise. There was a very, let's say controversial study published a couple of years ago from Julian Zirath's lab, which looked at type two diabetes uh, and the effects on blood glucose. And it looked at morning versus afternoon exercise. And the conclusion from that paper, if you remember, was that afternoon exercise was more beneficial. But we have to tell the listeners that it was a high intensity exercise protocol Well, they did high intensity reps. Now, when you do high intensity exercise, there's a response in the body, which means the, the liver puts out more glucose into the systemic circulation. So after their hit, after their high intensity exercise, there was actually profound hyperglycemia. So yes. in actual fact, the high intensity exercise in these people was having the opposite effect to what you wanted to do. So your point about the exercise intensity is very important. I would err on the side of conservatism at the moment rather than doing the high intensity stuff. Yeah. Especially when you're trying to get, as you said earlier on, but trying to get people to exercise. And, and sometimes you wonder if it's getting too complicated. You know, should I be doing hit? Should I be doing sit? Which... I have to clarify because sit people might think, oh yeah, I do I do lots of sit. <laughs> yeah. Sit is um sprint intensity training. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm tending to lean that way as well. And, and in the podcast, same with Jerry Dempsey, there was talk about uh, you know, athletes, you can get a drop in oxygen that can limit their VO2 max and whatever. It's all true. And you know, and the heart, you can get, you know, build up of calcium in plaques and whatever, but you know, they're not dangerous. And and you said a couple of times I've said, this is fantastic stuff, but let's not scare people off. Yeah. And yeah. let's try yeah. and keep it simple. Yeah. So I, snacking. I, yeah. That is the big problem though, Glenn. I mean, as we said, and you said in the introduction, people do not exercise. We know that certainly here in Australia, 60 odd percent of the population do not meet the normal recommendations. It's probably exactly the same in most, most of the Western world. So the prescription may be valid and scientifically proven, but it's useless if people aren't doing it. So um, I, I think we've got to really rethink the wheel here. Just continually regurgitating the same message to the public is not working. We need a simpler message often. And I agree, you know, we've got we've got sit, we've got hit, we've got MICT, moderate in intensity, continuous training. Yeah. It's confusing for us. So why is it? <laughs> Why should it not be confusing for the lay public? And I realized that when I started saying, oh, what about the intensity? I, I actually straight away started thinking, oh, I'm making it complicated. But yeah. that's the good thing as well, because as Ben Levine said, it's true. Sort of normal walking may not uh, increase your VO2 max and whatever. And it's going to have your metabolic, help your metabolic health. But, you know, then you say, oh, you've got to do something more vigorous. Well, why not just do vigorous walking? That's a very sensible, you know, just do normal walking. Yeah, include some vigorous walking. Yeah, do it throughout the day. The exercise, snacking. That's a simple message that people should be able to handle. Well, here's the other thing. And Marty Gibala from um, from McMaster University done some wonderful studies of just stair climbing. Yes. I mean, there's, there's some interesting data on that. So, uh, at a conference I was at recently, I forget where it was, somewhere in the world, um, the average uh, stairs that people will climb is 2.8 flights. So people will take the lift. You know, if the lift 
waiting and you've got to wait 10 minutes for the lift. People will climb on average 2.8 flights, but anything after that, they'll wait for the lift. Marty's study showed that, you know, just climbing six flights of stairs was absolutely enough to get almost close to 80 or 90% of maximal heart rate in some of these individuals. And again, you only need to do that two or three times a day. The interesting thing there, we're talking a, a little bit earlier on about uh, sitting. Uh, the prolonged sitting is also public enemy number one. And there's, again, been a lot of work done in that area. And just to break the periods of inactivity, I find myself tomorrow, for example, is a train smash. I know I have meetings from nine o'clock till four o'clock. And I said to my PA, <laughs> when am I going to go to the bathroom? When am I going to stand up? When am I going to do anything? Yes. I think we've got to get the message over that breaking inactivity is important. It's not exercise per se, exactly. but it's part of the message. And I think once we've got simpler messages you said across, we may get a, a greater uptake of some of the things that we're trying to convey. Well, the other thing is um, I often have meetings with people where I just go for a walk. You know, people always say, let's meet for coffee. And I say, let's go for a walk. I live next to the Yarra River. I know you live in the city as well. It's kind of weird. We're probably about 300 meters away. <laughs> I often say, let's just go for a walk. And they go, oh, that's true. And, well, that's, uh, it, it's funny you say that. We started doing that at, at lab meetings, going around the park and having meetings. And it, and it did work. We got out. It was a nice day. We got some fresh air. Yeah, there's, <laughs> yet, yet, I was to say, tomorrow I've got meetings in the boardroom from nine till four. So yeah, maybe should... you can't take the whole board for a walk. <laughs> boardwalk, there you go. Maybe, but, I should, maybe I should be doing more of my own uh, recommendations. Do as I say, not do as I do. I actually just, I just signed up Stuart Biddle, as you'd know. And he, he's yeah. from um, Queensland and he's going to be on. And it's a classic. He used to be at Victoria University. So we're both there. And he had a sign he'd wear and it would say, uh, walking meeting, please don't interrupt because he'd actually be walking and he'd have a thing on. Because people would come up, oh, Stuart, and chat, chat, chat. No, no, this is actually a proper meeting. I can you imagine you doing that. Now, that's very good. You've got to sometimes be a bit of a maverick and do things a little differently. Yeah. Yeah, I like right. it. So like step it. back a bit, make sure people are clear on that thing you said earlier, because I think it's very important. So, you were saying with the Moosey study from you know, Laurie Goodyear's lab, mm -hmm. um, that that was actually during exercise, because sometimes I, I put that in grants and things, and I think they don't quite get it. They think the exercise is improving. You're talking about actually during that 45 minutes of exercise, right. the glucose came down to normal. Yes. And us and others have shown that if you look at leg glucose uptake, so you actually look at the glucose uptake across the leg, it's totally normal. Yeah, so that's the thing people don't get. People with diabetes have problems with their insulin mm -hmm. stimulating glucose uptake in the muscle. Yeah, and but that's the traction is normal. Ex and that's the point. So again, for the listeners, you know, you, you've got insulin that takes glucose into the muscle cell and the muscle cell is the main, as we know, glucose tank for, for, for taking up glucose after a meal. But you've got contraction as well. And even if uh, the insulin pathways are defective, the contraction, in other words, the exercise pathways are intact. So exactly. it works. You know, if, if the, the body's remarkable, as you know, Glenn, I mean, if something's knocked out or doesn't work quite as well, something usually steps up in its place. So yeah. we've been designed by someone very wise. And she said, well, basically, if glucose uptake via the insulin pathway doesn't work, why well, that's exercise, which of course makes totally evolutionary sense. It makes complete sense, but it is an important message, yeah. And we were we were hunters and gatherers. So what does that mean? We were active the whole time. We're walking around, you know, picking berries. Yeah. And then you throw in the occasional, you know, high intensity when a lion runs out at you, you run up a tree and then you sit up there and you know chew away on your berries or whatever. We're not designed to like sit for no. hours and hours and hours. So it's just kind of logic, right? Well, this is the problem at the moment. And one of the talks I gave um, last week at South Korea was about exercise time and meal time. And one of my slides basically said, well, we've completely unraveled our evolution. You know, we can now get, I shouldn't be advertising, but Uber Eats or food delivered to us any time of the day or night. We're on our laptops at night. We are not necessarily outside as much as we should be. We're sitting all day. Some people do shift work. All these things have basically messed our normal circadian patterns up, but they've also created a lifestyle which means we're very, very prone to metabolic diseases. And I call these literally lifestyle-related diseases because it's the lifestyle that has changed so drastically in the last probably 30 or 40 years that we're now paying the consequences. And I think ultimately certainly in the states that the, the medical and healthcare system will crush the economy eventually yeah so th talking about that then so how things have changed the last 30 or 40 years it does my head in a little bit and I, I always think maybe I, I just haven't looked into it enough but you know people talking about oh it's the genetics it's the genetics that's the hunger ends uh, the hunger 
hormones and things that you can't help it. So, you know, you're just going to be overweight. You can't help it because if you lose weight, your hunger hormones crank up and whatever. What do you, what do you think about that? It's like, hang on, but people had hunger hormones 50 years ago. The human genome has not changed the last 10,000 years. What has changed is the environment. So there's a wonderful saying, and I forget who this should be attributed to. I think it was uh, Elliot Jocelyn, who was the founder of the Jocelyn wow. Diabetes Re Research Institute at Harvard University. And he said, genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. There you go. I think that is a fantastic thing because I get completely frustrated and fed up when I pick up a newspaper no matter what country I am and researchers find new gene for obesity no they didn't they yes. found a gene which was associated with a myriad of environmental factors which have combined to make that person overweight obese or type 2 diabetes so yes genetics plays an important part we know that there's familial history will predispose you to cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes or whatever but if the environment's correct, your chances of that eventuating are far less. So I really do believe that, you know, all these claims that the gene is responsible for this, that and the other go so far, but they absolutely do not explain why people get the current metabolic diseases in the rates of incidence that we're currently experiencing in the Western world. Yeah, I know. surely that makes sense. I mean, sure. Well, I think it does. I think it makes scientific sense, logical sense, teleological sense, and evolutionary sense. But um, you still get people perhaps arguing that it doesn't. So anyway, yeah, I think we agree on that point. <laughs> All right, cool. I only invite people that agree with me on this. <laughs> oh, I'm sure I'm, I can find something we can disagree on. <laughs> All right. so, um, so you touched on, you know, we, we said we talked about uh, exercise, but you've done a lot of stuff with diet and timing of, diet etc how yeah. about we think a little bit about you know with type 2 diabetes how much do you, of it do you think is diet how much is exercise obviously it's a balance in terms of their body weight mm -hmm. um you know there seems to be i don't know about you but i keep finding people always just talking about diet diet you know ah, uh, i even heard the other day someone said oh you do diet to lose weight and you do exercise to get buff I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> really yeah. I, I have a problem with most diets because most diets are actually unsuccessful let's be honest i mean you can calorie restrict an individual and you can put them in a study and you can do this and you follow them up a year later and they're back to their original weight mm -hmm. i guess the one thing i second message that's important to your listeners i don't give a damn what the scales say scales measure your body mass we as exercise physiologists or dietitians nutritionists athletes whatever you are out there listening you should be interested in your body composition namely the proportion of you which is fat mass and the proportion of you which is lean or other mass that has direct links to your health prognosis so let's just throw away the scales and i get i again i was in the gym in south korea last week firstly i was having to wear a mask because max are mandated indoors and it's hard to exercise at three and a half liters a minute if you're trying to do high intensity exercise with the mask on so point number one point number two why don't gyms have fans i have no idea oh my gosh. Air I think we talked about that before that's that was oh. no gripe forever it's crazy and point number three there was a machine which uh people stood on and actually a lot of people because I was next to the machine on my exercise bike and it had a vibrating rubber belt and you put it around your waist and you oh. stood on there for uh, 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 10 minutes I have no idea what that did and I haven't got the heart to tell these people that a you're not burning any calories and b you're not losing any fat I think that machine no, that machine 50 years ago I saw it on Twitter it's like a historical thing I thought <laughs> that was way out the window well, maybe it's a torture machine. But they started this vibration thing. It's a thing nowadays. Anyway, yeah. It's ridiculous. And, you know, there are so many gimmicks and things out there. I mean, we, we, we're coming back to the diet, but the point is weight is one thing. Yes. To lose lean mass is not a good thing. So the diet plays an important part and interacts with the exercise. And I don't think you can divorce the two. We always look at what we call the exercise diet interactions because that's very important if you're going to train you need the fuel to train but you need the correct fuel if yeah. you're trying to build muscle mass and i'm sure you've had speakers on to talk about this you probably need more protein and the such like so i i, I think most diets are, are doomed to failure unfortunately and yeah you diet to lose weight you exercise to get buff well there's a little bit of little bit of truth in that but i don't think that the diets are as successful as people think one thing that I do think, and we don't need to talk about this at, at too much length, but one thing that does seem to be working in our clinical trials and the human clinical trials throughout the world is something called time-restricted eating. Mm -hmm. And if you want, I can just 
give you yeah, a, sure. a very quick overview of that. So if you're listening now, just think uh, of the first time that you have an energy intake in the morning. It's usually your breakfast. And let's just say that you have breakfast at seven o'clock. Then I want you to think of the last time you had a calorie intake or an energy intake on a normal week. And that's probably, you know, eight or nine o'clock at night. So we say your eating window there is from seven o'clock till perhaps eight or nine o'clock. So it's a 12, 13, 14 hour eating window. Now, here's the interesting thing about what we call time restricted eating. I'm not going to tell you to stop eating ice cream, stop eating carbohydrate, stop doing this, that, and the other. Because when we tell people do not do that, <laughs> they want to do it more. Ball. It's like telling you not to have a drink of alcohol, Glenn. Of course, you're going to have a drink. But the at, point at two and a half years, I haven't had a drink. I know. That's why I said that. I'm very. Oh, you stir, You got me a treat. <laughs> I told you. I told you. I didn't agree with everything. You um, got me a the treat. point here is, we say to people, and they're bewildered. They say, "What do you mean? I can still eat this. I can still have ice cream." I say, "Yes, but here's the but." I want you to shift your breakfast till later by an hour or so. And I want to shift your evening meal earlier by a couple of hours. So your eating window is reduced from perhaps 12, 13, 14 hours to perhaps nine, 10, maybe even 11 if they were really extreme, even independent of any weight loss. So in the studies that have been done, there's an excellent study too now showing that even when people do not lose weight, they still get many of the metabolic health benefits. So simply reducing the time over the day of which you're eating without telling people, do not, do not, do not, do not. And I think this is holding a lot of promise. I've been more encouraged by this than any other diet study that we've done in the last decade. Yes, I know you've done a lot of work in this time-restricted feeding. And it just occurred to me, because I'm a bit of a, a night owl, and I'm a shocker. And I, I wonder how many people have problems with their, you know, their, their body, I was going to say their weight, but their body composition because of the way we tend to stay up late. Yeah. Uh, when you stay up, when I stay up late, I snack. I yeah. snack, snack. If I go to bed early, and my wife, Kathy's away in the US for two months. She normally, 10 o'clock, in bed. That's it. With yeah. her gone, I'm just like snacking all over the place. So well, I wonder. You're, you're clearly I've out of control. Greatly, I've greatly increased that time window that I'm eating. Well, here's the thing, Glenn. We should give you a continuous glucose monitor. So again, for your listeners, we stick a little patch on your arm. And we can literally monitor every minute of the day for two weeks of your data. And one of the, I think, really important findings from the time-restricted eating studies is that once you bring that evening meal in earlier, unlike you snacking at late night, which is not what you're meant to do, your blood glucose control in the night is remarkably good. It's massively improved. Now, what people don't realize is that, you know, you spend eight to 10 hours in bed or, or lying down or whatever, that's, you know, almost 50% of the day. So if you can take care of that 50% of the day and you're doing some exercise snacking in the day, your glycemic control can be returned to normal within two to three months. It's incredible. So we call those, you know, what you're describing is the late night snacking phenomenon. We call those discretionary foods because if you think about, well, let me ask you, what do you eat late at night? Is it candies, alcohol, ice cream? It's snack stuff, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's not essential food. It's not food. food. Yeah, exactly. It's that's the common number one. So we call those with our subjects discretionary foods. And we say, don't cut out the discretionary foods, but after six or seven o'clock, you don't need them anymore. And once they see their glucose profile is improved during the night and it gives them literally instant feedback, that's it. They they tend to really very rapidly alter their dietary intake. Yeah, I wonder if the old adage, you know, early to bed, early to rise, I wonder if people have looked at their body composition, people that do that, because yeah, yeah, you know, they're cutting out the snacks. I, I, I'm kind of getting a bit away from your time. So you, your point there, though, is if you try and, um, you know, finish eating a bit earlier at night and then start eating. And that's the interesting thing as well. I don't know about you. It's a personal thing. But quite often in the morning, so forget the thing about going to bed late or whatever, just if I'm on a normal schedule. I often don't feel like eating that much in the morning. I feel a bit sort of um, nauseous, just a little bit like I don't feel like eating, but people say, oh, but breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Well, and that's, that's quite a controversial thing at the moment. So I'll give you a, a personal example. So uh, some of your listeners may know who my wife is. It's Louise Burke, who you've yes. had on your podcast. And if I had a dollar for every time I was introduced as Louise Burke's husband, I could have retired like you then oh. years ago. Um, but be that as it may, she's a she's a, a, a an early morning riser. She's a 
she's a lark or an owl, I'm not sure which is which, but she's up before I even get out of bed. She's on the exercise because she's done her exercise. She prefers to do it in the morning. I can't do that. I can't do any intensity in the morning. I'm a, I usually a late afternoon exerciser. Now, there are what we call circadian phenotypes, which make us either owls or larks. You can change that to some degree, but yeah, the, the breakfast meal is important. She'll get up and she'll be fasted. She'll do her exercise there. As we know, if you're fasted after an overnight fast, you'll generally burn more fat in the morning than you would if you'd had breakfast and the such like. So again, it's this exercise nutrient interaction that we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but again, if you think about Western society, we tend to back end most of our calories. There's an excellent study done by Sachin Panda from the Salk Institute, and he gave people a smartphone app and he asked them 150 odd people he asked them to record every time they took in a calorie or any energy intake and he found that they back-ended their calorie intake so most of the calories were eaten after one o'clock in the afternoon so the total oh. daily consumption i think it was 64 percent were eaten after one o'clock and just simply by shifting that evening meal in a little bit earlier and trying to get people to redistribute their energy not change their energy redistribute it has enormous metabolic benefits. Yeah, yeah. And and there's also the circadian stuff. I know you've looked at that a little bit as well. So, you know, the, we know the shift workers have more diabetes and all sorts of problems. Yeah. We wonder how much of that is they're eating at the wrong time of the day, but also they, they tend to eat, uh, well, I think this is a bit controversial, but they tend to not eat as well. So you'll tend to just sort of grab. Um, so, so what about this sort of chronobiology uh, side of things? Well, again, it gets back to what we were discussing earlier. We've sort of messed up the, nor the normal patterns of circadian rhythms, as I said, by snacking late, by working 24-7, uh, access to computers and the light late in the day, prolonged sitting, et cetera. So all these things tend to mess up the circadian biology. Can you correct them? Well, I, I like to think that exercise and diet can recalibrate the circadian clock, and that's the way we look at it with our subjects. So if you can add the exercise, you can get rid of a lot of the prolonged sitting, if you can get outside, get some daylight, because the main time giver for the circadian clock is the light dark cycle. So if you're indoors, for example, you know, in South Korea last week, and as you know, because you've been to many conferences, Glenn, you go to a conference and you're basically, you're, you're inside sitting down all day and you're thinking, hold on, the guy at the front's telling me I should be doing this, that and the other. I'm doing exactly the opposite. I'm sitting in a dark room for eight hours a day, not getting any exercise, going out at late, late at night, eating, blah, blah, blah. So We've completely messed up the normal circadian biology. And as I say, the work that we're doing is to try and recalibrate, if you like, the circadian clock by putting exercise in there and appropriate timing of meals. And the one thing we touched on, we mentioned earlier that the exercise recommendations, but here's an interesting point. In no national food guidelines, is there any mention of the timing of food? We talk about the energy, we talk about the meal composition. In other words, how much of your diet is carbohydrate, fat, and protein. There is no mention yet, I think it will come in the next decade, of the timing of meals. And I think science will push that along such that the national recommendations, at least in countries who, who are looking at the scientific literature, will take up the message and say, hold on, timing, timing should be added. Maybe we should mention something about timing. So that's vitally important. And again, it gets back to what we we're talking about earlier. The timing of exercise is important. Only recently have the American College of Sports Medicine acknowledged that these exercise snacks, taking little bouts of exercise and accumulating throughout the day are just as beneficial and in some cases more beneficial than your traditional bang, 30 minutes of exercise, continuous, moderate intensity. So I think the times they are a changing, but they are changing very slowly. Well, I just had uh, two weeks ago, I had Eddie Coyle on and he was talking about how if you do exercise that you don't do enough steps during the day, you don't have the same benefits the next day as well. So, so that's when he does, you know, tr sorry, traditional, so like an hour of exercise in the evening. Yes. Found they didn't have as good fat oxidation the next day if they didn't do steps as well during that day. So you need the, the snacking. Well, that's a, that's a really, that's a great study in JOP that I read and I, I, I completely echo it. So does the hour in the gym make up for the rest of the day? And, and, and the answer is no, of course, the hour in the gym is great, but not if you're going to sit for the next, you know, 10, 11 hours. So exactly. yeah, I'm, I'm dreading tomorrow because I know I'm literally going to be sitting for eight hours and I will exercise at night, but I'm fully aware that 
with a reduced step intake in the day, I'm not really optimizing the beneficial effects of exercise. Perfect. All right. Now, just I also thought when you were talking about the exercise snacking, it's, it's kind of peripheral, but remember for a while there, people were saying, you know, we shouldn't really be having like three big meals a day. That was sort of like the industrial revolution. They brought it in so you could get them to eat before work and then have a break and then eat, eat after work. Yep. Do you know what where that's at? For a while there, people used to say, you're better off eating a little bit throughout the day. Okay, well, mm. let's narrow the time, of course. But um, do you know where that's at by any chance? Should you I be food so snacking and exercise snacking? Let me give you some information which your readers will never, ever, ever use need to use. So this was in my talk last week. The term three meals a day actually comes from the British Navy in the 40s and 50s because the, sail, the, the sailors on the ship used to collect their meals in square containers. Three square meals a day. And, and it was that's where the term three square meals a day comes from. Now, to bridge that to your question, we've got all sorts of these, and I'll call them diets for want of a better word, you know, the intermittent fasting, the, the five plus two, the, all, all these things which can change the patterns of eating. Now, I am very wary, and I'll put this on the record, of these prolonged fasting type of diets for the main reason that even when you reduce your energy intake by as little as 500 kilocalories a day for three or four days, we have shown and others have confirmed this, that your rates of protein synthesis, in other words, your muscle building capacity is reduced by about 20%. Now, if you're fasting, let's say doing the five plus two diet and you're fasting for two days, whether it's the weekend or two days in the week, you think of that over the course of the year, you're fasting for many, many, many days, you're losing muscle mass. And as I said earlier, I don't care what your weight is, I could really am concerned about your body composition. So I worry about the fasting diets in that you may lose weight, you may lose scale weight, but it's not good if you're losing muscle mass. And again, when you reduce by a very small proportion, your energy intake, we are clearly shown that your rates of protein synthesis are reduced. That is not a good thing. That's why I'm a little uh, against that. Now, let's get back to your question. I mean, maybe I'm not a good example, but I have a, a pretty big breakfast. I go most of the day with either a yogurt or chocolate milk or some protein at lunchtime and an evening meal. Again, I'm a little bit TRE. I finished eating by eight o'clock and I've usually finished eating in the evening by six or seven o'clock. I don't have the traditional three square meals a day. Um, my staff look at me and think, you know, this is crazy. I think what works for the individual is very important. I think a blanket recommendation, one size fits all, is not what we're looking at. I think very much it's a work environment thing. It's a social thing. Uh, it, it's a family thing. You know, if you've got kids, you're going to be eating with family at night and this, that, and the other. So there are many things there. And I think just to say this works or that works and you should be doing this is a little bit too rigid. Yeah. So it just occurred to me, this is all great stuff, but I guess we haven't talked about applying this to people with type 2 diabetes that much. We've just been talking about general sort of discussion. Would most of these things we've talked about, I know you probably can't, you're going to think, hang on, what do we want to talk about? Um, fit with a person with type 2 diabetes as well? Or I guess it depends on if they're on medications or not, if they're... No, no, no. Look, look most, of, most of what we said is absolutely the same for the type 2 diabetic patient or someone with insulin resistance or obesity. In fact, most of our studies have been... Uh, done by Evelyn Parr in our laboratory and they've been on type 2 diabetic subjects and I think let's just focus very much on exercise and type 2 diabetes anytime you do ex exercise and it looks from the studies at the moment that the afternoon exercise is more beneficial and why is that well it's for the reason that your nocturnal glucose in other words your glucose concentrations while you're in bed asleep is much better maintained and much better controlled when you've done some later in the day exercise. I'm not going to say even exercise, I'm going to say later in the day exercise, as opposed to a, exactly the same amount of exercise in the morning. And I think for the type 2 diabetic patient, and again, the person who is predisposed to overweight, obesity, or type 2 diabetes, I think we should be looking more at the glucose control over the day, whereas at the moment, the physician brings you in for a you know, a fasting glucose. It's like, what the heck? That doesn't mean anything. I'm sorry, Glenn. It means I totally absolutely agree. nothing. Yeah. I totally agree. I mean, you mentioned continuous glucose monitors the other uh, before. Um, you know, I'm a big fan. I st we started doing some research at Copenhagen where, you know, even the clamp, the gold standard clamp measurement of insulin sensitivity, I don't think is as relevant as what's happening with the continuous glucose monitor. 
Correct. Because you clamp it at, at five millimole, yeah. which is unrelevant. It's not relevant to when you eat and it goes up and down. So anyway, that's a bit of a long story, but I'm, I actually agree that I think continuous glucose monitoring um, is a good way to actually see what's going on. It's a fantastic way. You, you do yeah. exercise, you see what happens, you, you yeah. eat, you see what happens, you look overnight, you see what happens. Yeah. But along those lines, though, I, I've, I've keep seeing this talk, um, some of these sort of influences and things, they make it sound like everyone should be wearing a continuous glucose monitor. No. I mean, okay, what do you think about that first? But But also, what do you think about someone with type 2 diabetes being encouraged to wear continuous glucose monitoring. At the moment, we tend to think about people with type 1. But, you know, even for a little while, it seemed maybe sensible, right, for them to get that feedback. Yeah, look, it, it, it's like the new gimmick on town. They're very good, these monitors. The technology is evolving continually such that now you can put a patch on someone and bring them back two weeks later and you've got, you know, millions of data points, more, more data than you know what to do with. <laughs> Let me just go back and answer one question first. We mentioned about, you mentioned about the clamp and uh, I mentioned about something else. What I would like to see more happen, we're trying to get this back to the real world so your audience can relate to it. Typically, when you go into a clinician now, you'll get a fasting glucose, which you and I agree on is a total waste of time. It's a snapshot of what happened there. You're probably a bit nervous in the doctor's surgery. It's like blood pressure. You know, it, it's not really a, a very good measure if you just do a one-off. The oral glucose tolerance test is another thing which I think is just completely irrelevant. So again, for your listeners, we typically give around a, an 80 gram bolus of glucose. We get someone sitting down, we take glucose for two hours and we see how they respond to that. That's not real life. We've moved away from that and we do real live meal testing. We look at the response to a mixed meal of what the subject or participant or clinical person, whatever it happens to be, would eat during the day because that's relevant for them. Just exactly. bunging down eight, 80 grams of glucose is not, There's no you way you could drink. Uh, it's no way in nature you get, you know, 80 grams of glucose. And indeed, you know, Michelle Kesky from Deakin, she's actually showing that you do an oral glucose tolerance test, it reduces your muscle blood flow. <laughs> you do a meal test, it yes. increases, because insulin's meant to increase your blood flow. Yeah. But when you do it so artificially, it actually yeah. decreased it. Yeah. And when you did it with a meal test, it increased it, which is what you'd expect. Yeah. Well, so. again, we're, we're exactly on the same track here. So I would firstly, again, and I'm not poo-pooing the clinicians, I realize that, you know, you probably can't do some of these sophisticated tests that we can do in the laboratory, but really a fasting overnight glucose, get rid of it. Uh, oral glucose tolerance test well again the fact that you give 80 grams of glucose to a person who weighs 50 kilos and to someone who weighs 100 kilos where they've got totally different blood volume what is going on there yeah. <laughs> i just do not understand that and i think we've, we've both done enough work well, it's like it's like when we used to do carbohydrate ingestion because uh, we used to give everyone 250 mils during yeah. exercise every 15 minutes yeah. I'm like, hang on a minute, this guy's 50 kilograms, this guy's 100 kilograms. Yeah. So we started doing three meals per kilogram every 15 minutes. It's like yeah, we've, we've changed in sport. That's the interesting thing there, Glenn. You've hit the nail on the head. Sports nutrition has recognized that, but the clinicians still are in the dark ages. And, you know, we'll probably get some flack for well, saying that. But It's also um, easier. It's more expedient. Yeah. Yeah, it is. As I said, it's practical. It's, it's much easier to do. But the point is, it's not real world. And for your listeners, you want real world things. And again, the CGMS, get to back, back to your question, should everyone be wearing them? Well, no, they shouldn't. Certainly, I don't think there's any use in athletes wearing them. And I gave a talk to, um, to a company the other day about the use of heart, not heart rate monitors, blood glucose monitors for athletes. And I, I don't think there's any point, to be completely honest, because athletes have very good glucose control. They're very insulin sensitive and it's a waste of time and money. I think one study that we're actually doing at the moment that Evelyn Parr is doing is where we give our type 2 diabetic patients glucose monitors and instead of masking them, which is what we normally do in studies where the subject or patient doesn't see their data, but we can collect it and then we give them feedback, obviously, after the study, we unmask it. And I wore one of these for a couple of weeks and, you know, I eat a lot of ice cream and, you know, I like chocolate as well. The response to ice cream and some of these foods is like, whoa, you need to knock this on the head a bit. You know, your glucose excursions are quite wild. So I think they're a really good tool to give very instant feedback on an individual basis to patients or whoever the population happens to be that they can see, okay, 
this is my response to this meal at this time of the day. This is my response at this time of the day. Whoa, my glucose is completely out of whack. I've either got to knock this on the head or I've got to bring it in earlier. So in answer to that question, I think they can definitely be used there. You don't need them for months and months and months. You can get that in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I wonder though, like, you know, as I was saying, getting a person with type 2 diabetes one for a couple of weeks, I think that would be really important. And I, I think it's unmasked. Um, because you vitally, know it's incredible vitally important. Like you said, the type ones, yes, I mean, they have a different sort of a problem. And, you know, hypoglycemia is as much a problem when they exercise as, as hyperglycemia in the type two. But if you've got someone out there listening and they've got access to one of these CGMSs and someone who can, you know, download the data for them and take a peek, uh, it, it's really very, very valuable. And I think on an individual basis, it's essential because one size again doesn't fit all. And I'd, I'd urge definitely a two or three week period where you're in normal daily living situations, you know, you're not on holiday, you're not uh, doing a job which you don't normally do, you're not changing your exercise or nutrient patterns or whatever it happens to be. I think it's, I think it's great. Instant feedback. And th unless they don't do any exercise, so you'd encourage them if they don't do any exercise, do some exercise and see what actually happens because that's, that's the amazing thing. So yeah. Yeah. So getting back again to some of the stuff we said at the start. So, you know, during exercise and people with type two diabetes, you know, I mean, fair to say though, the Moosey study was fairly intense. So 45 minutes of, of uh, it was right. yeah, pretty intense, but the, the glucose, the point is that the glucose comes down during exercise. And then, as you said, the muscle then remains more sensitive to insulin for, you know, 24 to 48 hours or even longer. Right. Yes. So why don't we just flesh that out a little bit? So, so, it's beautiful because, you know, if you do exercise every couple of days, your insulin sensitivity is going to remain elevated. And that's the point. It's not, we're not saying to people, you've got to go out and run a marathon every day. We are saying exactly like you've just said, Glenn, that the muscles insulin sensitivity is remarkably well maintained for at least 24, 48 hours. So just get people to do something on a Monday, Wednesday or Friday, and then perhaps go out at the weekend and, you know, walk with your partner or do whatever you want to do type thing. We're not prescribing, you know, what I think are ridiculous amounts of exercise. And just on that, you said, you mentioned that the Moosey protocol was quite intense exercise and it, and it was, and it was continuous. I'd like to point out in our exercise snacking study where we only got subjects to, to walk, we did see, you know, drops of one and a half to two millimoles in glucose just from people walking. So again, the walking was adequate stimulus. And I want yes. to get away from this fact that people have to be out there running around the park or, or cycling and doing triathlons. They don't, particularly if they're inactive to start with. Any exercise is good. Any exercise is good. And I think walking is vastly underrated. You put a hill in, and walk up a hill that's absolutely for most people that's high intensity exercise if well, you mentioned new zealand we mentioned new zealand <laughs> day i used to live in dunedin you know well oh. my mum lived in dunedin and i'd go back there and that was ridiculous i'd go for a ride and you'd see on my strava it would be like a star because i'd go up this oh that's too hard <laughs> you know depending on where you live if you don't live they have, in, don't they have the world they have the world's steepest street don't they or something and they have a race on the street it's, a, it's, it's the most ridiculous thing. I tried to start running up it once and I thought, no, blow this for a lot. <laughs> but if you don't, oh my gosh, no, 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 don't do that. No, no. I no. didn't even think about that. <laughs> I, I walked up it. But, but um, again, hills, hills are an easy way to overload. The other way, of course, is just to do, you know, when we think of high intensity training or interval training, let's get the high intensity out of it. Let's just think of interval training. You've got your overweight uh, subject who's predisposed to type 2 diabetes walk gently between two lampposts walk briskly between the next two that's interval exactly. training guys it doesn't have to be on a track with a stopwatch exactly. that is interval training all interval training means is periods of higher intensity with periods of lower intensity recovery so that's the way to start even when people are starting on you know marathon running programs i say well you know Jog a couple of lampposts, then walk. Jog a couple, then walk. I say, oh, yeah, that, you know, I, I can do two, two or three days like that. Yes, but you couldn't do it continuously. Just build up gradually. And remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. You know, yes. I, a lot of people come into us and say, look, you know, I'm overweight. I've put on so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. It's like that, that didn't happen overnight. Please don't ask me to cure you overnight, all right? Yes. Just remember this takes some time and more importantly, it's a lifestyle change. And I say to people, once you've done three months of this, that's habit changing. We need to change your behavioral patterns. 
And that's very important. And generally after three months, they don't fall off the wagon again. They're, that's it for life. You've got to get them to that three month point though, Glenn. And that's sometimes very hard. <laughs> Quite a long time, I guess. Yeah. And the other thing is they, 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 you can't be too hard on yourself. So, you know, I've spoken to people with type 2 diabetes. Oh, I did exercise for a while. And then, you know, they, they miss, miss it. That's it. They miss a day. It's like, hang on. Every bout of exercise is good for you. Try right. and think of that like that. Or, okay, and let's get away from exercise. So every bout of activity mm -hmm. is good for you. You don't have to focus on, oh, I missed, I missed an exercise bout. Forget it. You know? It's money in the bank. The way we always say to them, you deposit your money in the bank. Every exercise session is money in the bank. You can withdraw on it later. Okay. The more you do, you know, the more you've got to withdraw later. So I like, I like your analogy. You know, don't panic if you miss a day. You're not going to fall apart. Hey, I've got on Twitter, I asked people like before you came in, if there's any questions, I got a couple. There's a good chap, Jeff Rothschild from um, New Zealand. He asked me to ask you if what would be your dream study if there was no re resources, logistics, whatever, you just someone gave you five, I was going to say million, five billion dollars. <laughs> what would be your dream? Well, okay, not, maybe not five billion. That would you'd change the whole system. Dream study. What would you do a dream study? Yeah. That's a great question because it's one I always ask postdocs at the interview and inevitably it, uh, it, it, it flux, fluxes them. They, they, they can't think of an answer. A dream study. Oh, do now you, I've got you on that. Do you mean in the area of type 2 diabetes? Yeah, I guess, well, yeah, well, a bit, well, that's a bit of a tough one. Yeah, that's just, just a dream. Right. Study. In diabetes, I mean, I would really like to do some very well-controlled laboratory studies to start with to show what we call proof of concept. But then I think What's missing in science at the moment is taking it out into the real world. And let me give you an example. You know the work that we're doing in the, in the labs at the moment. We're doing lots on time-restricted feeding. We're doing lots on exercise and type 2 diabetes. And let's just keep it in the type 2 diabetes realm because it makes my life a little bit easier at the moment as well. A lot of the studies we do are very good. They're very well controlled. They're laboratory controlled. We feed subjects. We bring them in. We monitor this. We measure that. We do this. Fantastic. They last for about four weeks, sometimes eight weeks. And I've just told you that to change people's habits, no. we need three months. So firstly, I don't think we need $5 billion. I just think we need more longitudinal studies. We've got a study which we're doing at the moment with Leonie Helbron at the University of Adelaide, where we're looking at time-restricted feeding, and it's a year-long study. A lot of money, $1 million. That is really what we should be doing, because doing these very short-term studies and you may say, the audience may say, well, why are you doing these short-term studies? Because that's all the money that we get. Exactly. That's literally, and that's another discussion. You should have someone funding. who talks about grants. Mm -hmm. Funding is a major headache for researchers such as myself who have a lab with running costs, which are, you know, keep me awake at night type thing. The point is we do these lovely little proof of concept studies in the laboratory, as I said, very well controlled. Let's take them out into the real world with real people, with real families, with real jobs, with children, with meals that have to be fitted around kids' schedules and everything else, and then let's see what's going on. That's the nice. thing. So talking about real world, I can't help thinking, sometimes when we do our studies in people with type 2 diabetes, we get your diet controlled people. They're not your real average person with type 2 diabetes. Do you think we can apply, and who knows, because most of the studies haven't been done, can we apply most of these findings to real world people with type 2 diabetes? <laughs> yes, uh, I have to say yes, because otherwise I'll get my funding taken away. But the real answer is probably not, um, in all honesty. No, you're right. It, it's, it's somewhat of an artificial thing. And again, the, the type of subjects who we get to come in for these studies, uh, you know, they're volunteers. They usually have time in the day. They're, they're not the typical everyday person. So it, it worries me a lot that a lot of the laboratory conclusions may not even apply to real world findings or real world living as, as we've got it so again the question was what would you do if you had five million or five billion dollars i'd like to do longitudinal studies with real world people in real world settings and see if some of the laboratory results and data that we've got hold up i think yeah, some of them would but perhaps perhaps not as much as we might think yeah we tend to be interested in mechanisms and getting in people in and we do biopsies and things but probably the most important thing would be to have a whole bunch of of you know diet control people with type 2 diabetes controls and then some of your sort of garden variety people with type 2 diabetes follow them for a year with continuous glucose monitoring absolutely i mean though that's what we're doing essentially in this study at the moment with time restricted eating 
Um, but again, as far as I know, this is the, the longest study and we, we scour the clinical trials registry worldwide. I think this is the longest study at the moment. Most of the studies, there's just been one published in the New England Journal of Medicine, 14 weeks. I'm like, well, that's quite a long while. And you think 14 weeks isn't a long while in someone's life. It's absolutely not. It didn't take you, took you more than 14 weeks to get type two diabetes. So, you know, what's exactly. 14 weeks the other side? So that, that's what I would do. It's a really good question. I must um, give that a little bit more thought. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess everything in, in life nowadays is a quick fix. Yeah? If people want a quick fix, uh, you know, this diet didn't work, this exercise didn't work, this, this I don't know, whatever it is, isn't working. <laughs> yeah. It's well, hard nowadays. Our, our, maybe our attention spans are... Well, you, you're dead right. I mean, don't, don't the news people say now that they've reduced the news bulletins because people's like attention spans are so small. But I'll tell you another revealing fact. When we look at... Uh, when we interview the, lots of the participants who come in, particularly for our weight loss studies, the alarming thing, Glenn, is that some of them have been on 13 or 14 different diets. They've literally tried. You're, you're absolutely correct. They've tried this. Didn't work. Quick fix. Let's move on to the next one. You know, the Victoria Principle grapefruit diet or, you know, someone's soup diet or whatever it is. Or I mean, these are just nonsense things. Most of these celebrity stuff are just, you know, a bunch of, you know what they're just they're just not worth promulgating or even talking about but they look like they might work so people you know your type two subject your athlete anyone is absolutely prone to marketing and advertising and your quick fix is the way that people want to go and that's not a message which i i think needs turning around completely as i say you don't wake up one day and think wow i've got 20 kilos on overnight it doesn't work like that so no. don't to reverse it in a day or a week yeah quick fixes oh, are great problem. i wanted to talk to you about a bit about some mechanisms and things but i think you've got to go is that right i've got a few more minutes we can talk mechanisms and take a bit of a deep dive i'll um i'll keep the other people in the boardroom waiting that's okay you're more sure? important yeah i'm sure you owe me big time <laughs> well i guess i guess you know what what are the mechanisms going on there with um so okay we've talked about acute exercise and we can there's all sorts of stuff going on in the muscle during that time. But if we think more importantly, probably over the long term, what do you think the mechanisms are that you're getting the improvements in insulin sensitivity? And, and, the, and the thing also about, um, you know, as you know, we tend to talk about exercise training being like a series of acute bouts. Just wondering what you think is going on there. Okay, well, let's take your last point first, because that's a good one. Let's, and it gets back to what we said earlier. Uh, about what I said about money in the bank. Each acute exercise bout adds up and eventually all these little exercise bout make you a trained individual. And that's in essence what we're doing. We're trying to accumulate uh, the acute benefits of exercise over the long term. And that's a really good way to think about it because as we said, you know, half an hour ago, the acute bouts of exercise are very good at lowering blood glucose, are very good at taking glucose into the muscle post-exercise. So if you keep doing that every other day, bang, you're in business and you become a trained individual. Now, lots is going on at the muscle. Hopefully, if you're doing a little bit of resistance exercise, you've got a greater muscle mass. You've got to go to sink for blood glucose to be disposed of. Number one, you're upregulating a lot of pathways in skeletal muscle. You're increasing what we call glucose transporters, this protein that we have on the membrane called GLUT4. When you've done a lot of work in this area, so you know an awful lot more about this than I do. We're literally initiating a whole lot of cascade of events in skeletal muscle, which make the muscle more efficient at taking up blood glucose, more efficient at oxidizing it, and in some cases, more efficient at storing it. So we tend to attack this problem from three, if you like, uh, prongs. And exercise does all of these. And that's the beneficial effect of exercise as opposed to just the diet. The diet, yes, you can increase insulin sensitivity by doing various things, but you do not increase muscle mass just by diet alone you need the contraction you do not upregulate some of these signaling pathways in the muscle which are responsible for you know getting more mitochondria getting the muscle more insulin sensitive getting more glucose transporters and the such like so again exercise on its own is fantastic diet on its own not so fantastic but exercise and diet combined give you the best of the both worlds exactly because you've got to be like turning it over right so if you're dieting you're not actually turning over what's in the muscle you're turning it over. So, you know, the classic thing with the intramuscular fat, you know, I had Brett Goodpasker on right at the start a few months ago, you know, that the, you can have increased intramuscular fat if you're a trained athlete, 
Mm-hmm. Increase intramuscular fat if you're a obese and type two diabetic, but you're not turning it over. No, and that's the whole point. It's it's what we call the flux in the system. So it's literally you've got this inert store, and you've used the example, and Brett's done great work in this area of the fact that athlete is called the athlete's paradox. So both athletes, for your listeners who didn't hear Brett's talk, both the athlete and the type two diabetic have large stores of fat within the muscle, but the athlete's turning it over on a daily basis. And so it doesn't just sit there inert and cause all the problems with sigillin. The type two diabetic subject, on the other hand, may not be exercising and it becomes a problem for them and makes them insulin resistant. So it is what we call the athlete's paradox. And the, I guess the idea there and the way I like to, when I talk to undergrad students about exercise is my, and maybe we'll leave the, the listeners with this, the analogy is that you drive two cars into the garage. One's a, if you like, a Porsche, and you drive it into the garage, you park it, you take out the key. The other one's a dumpy old Volkswagen, doesn't do any mileage or this, that, and the other. So one's the athlete and one's the overweight or sedentary individual. You take both the keys out the door, you close the garage doors, you go home, you know, you have your movie and watch your TV or do whatever you do. The analogy is that overnight, the Porsche is still turning over. It's like humming along and it's almost in first gear. So it's burning fuel, it's turning stuff over. The inert car, the the Beetle or the VW or whatever, the one who doesn't do any exercise or doesn't do any driving during the day, that's turned off completely. The switch is off. You get back in the morning, the Porsche is ready to go. It's been purring along all night. It's ready. It's turned over fuel. The other one's not. It stutters, it starts. It may start second or third time. And that's the way we should think of the human body. We want to be in a continual state of turning fuel over. What's the best way to do that? It's to the burn the fuel to replace the fuel, to burn the fuel to replace the fuel. Subdate, substrate turnover is very important. And what's the best thing to do that? The combination of exercise and diet. Correct. All right, perfect. All right, so thank you very much. I know you've got a, a boardroom waiting for you there. So Sorry, thank you very Glenn. much for taking the time. No, it's great. It's been a good chat. So okay. uh, I'll see you next time. Good to see you again. And uh, the fact that we live 400 meters apart maybe means we should probably do one of these uh, walking meetings. Walking next on time. the river. Well, you know what's funny? It's because we both live in an apartment. You're talking yeah. about cars in the garage. But twice <laughs> mine's died because I never use it because I just walk around the city. <laughs> I, I don't have a, I have three car park spaces. I don't have a car in Melbourne. I walk everywhere. Do you rent them out? Okay, that's another story. Okay. <laughs> if you want to rent one, you can. Okay, right. good on you, John. And on that note, we'll leave. Thanks, Glenn. Cheers. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya.